So I am so thankful that Stephanie Buma could take time out of her busy schedule to speak to us today. She, I, I am biased, I think she's amazing. She is my husband's sister, and so I've known her since about 2000. And at first I was super intimidated by her confidence and her strength. And uh, if you don't know this about me, I'm by nature very shy <laughs> and anxious. So um, I was intimidated at first, but I came to admire her strength and her faith and her fierce love for her family. And I hope you all are blessed by what she shares today about how God walked with her and guided her through breast cancer. I've heard it said when God gives us a test, then we have a testimony. And Stephanie really has an amazing testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Uh. And my name is Liz, and I'm also a sister-in-law of these girls. And I'm going to open us up in prayer for Steph. Lord, we thank you for each mom that's here, each mom that desires to serve you better and know you more and grow deeper in their faith. Lord, I just invite you to be here in this place. Lord, I pray that you would give Stephanie your words. Thank you for her willingness to share in the vulnerable and in the hard. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. And Lord, that through this story, we get to see Stephanie's faithfulness to you. I pray that you would just go behind and before that you'd be in this place, Lord, and thank you for your love. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning. I think I'm going to take this out. So, like uh, my sister-in-law Erica said, my name is Stephanie Buma, and um, I have been married for almost 30 years. So I got married when I was 18, and my husband was 20, and we will celebrate our 30th, uh, which, is this too loud? I can't hear quite myself. Um, so we will celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary in July. Um, we have three kids. So our son Eli is 27. Um, so I've been parenting for a long time. Um, but our son Eli is 27, and he is a firefighter out in Shady Cove. He's married to our daughter-in-law, Megan, and they have two kids, Selah and Henry. Selah is two, and Henry is eight months. Um, my son, Ryan, is 24, and he lives out in Rogue River. So Eli lives just down the street from us, and um, Ryan and, he, and his wife, Danica, live in Rogue River. Um, they've been married for three years. And then we have our daughter, Ellie, who is 12, and she's in the sixth grade. She goes to Harvest Baptist in Medford. So, you know, life's pretty busy, and um, I'm a practical nurse, so I work with my mom at a little in-home care company in Medford. Um, yeah, and, and like Erica said, quite a bit of my family goes to community, or Eagle Point Community Bible Church, so they do attend here. Um, I also have to say, this is the first time, I feel like I just need to get the crying out of the way. This is the first time I'm sharing this story. And it is such an honor to be up here, but it's incredibly hard. So thank you in advance uh, for your graciousness as I, hopefully this is the only time I cry. Um, it's, like I said, it's nice to kind of get it out of the way. And um, yeah, so we will get started. Lamentations 3, 20 through 24. My soul is downcast within me, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. And then Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. 
If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Um, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the, and the light become night around me, even then the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So a few weeks ago, like three weeks ago, my 12-year-old daughter, Ellie, myself and my husband, we were at Hershey Amusement Park. And as we were walking through the park, you go by these rides, and they're just sweet. It's for the little kids. They're, the moms are sitting, and the dads are sitting with the, their little kids. And the, the ride is smooth. They're going around. Everyone is laughing, having a great time. Nothing intense is going on. And sometimes our life is like that. We may have long seasons. Maybe that has been your only season in life to where the ride, I mean, it's literally a seatbelt that you have on, and, you know, and, and it's cheerful, it's happy, it's, it's easy. And then, well, backing up, this summer I was at a camp out with your guys' church, and my friend Selena was there also. And she was telling me about a trip to Disneyland they had taken, and she's the cool mom. She had ridden all the rides with her, with her girls. And I'm like, and she rode like Magic, not Kingdom, uh, Magic Mountain, Magic Mountain. So she had ridden all these intense rides, and she showed me a picture of herself on the ride. And it's like, it was, they're funny, we laughed, and I'm like, Selena, I cannot believe you're that mom. That is awesome. I'm the mom. I, I'll be on the, the ride that goes really easy, but I get migraines easy. I don't, I don't do that. But when we were at Hershey Amusement Park a couple of weeks ago, my daughter Ellie was like, Mom, please. And I'm like, I'm remembering Selena's the cool mom. I want to be the cool mom. So I'm like, okay, Els, let's, let's get on just a, a crazy ride. Let's just do it. You know, they strap you in, you're, you're strapped in, and I'm not really sure what to expect. It's been since I was like 18, 19, since I've been on any sort of a roller coaster or a ride. You guys, it was crazy. So we're going, I'm screaming the entire time. My daughter Ellie is holding on to me for, and, and not saying a word. And when we get to the end of the ride, and it's flip, it's doing all the things that crazy rides do. But when we get to the end of the ride, I'm like, my mouth is wide open. I'm like, ah! And we get to the end of the ride, and it stops, and I'm like, what is wet on the side of my face? I had drooled, you guys. Drool had come out of my mouth. I'm sure it's like when your windshield wiper fluid is on, and the cars behind you, you see them turning on their windshield wipers. You know, it's, and it's like, oh, no. And the picture, I'm like, ah, and, and the, you can't see the drool, but I had drooled. It was just that kind of a ride. And sometimes that is life. So sometimes that is a good, uh, uh, your life will go through a season or, or a long season, or maybe even for the rest of your life, where it's a crazy ride, you're strapped in, so you're safe, but, but it's crazy, and, and you're screaming, and, and it's overwhelming, and that has been my season for, well, really the last three years, but especially the last year and a half. So um, in March of 2022, my husband, and Ellie and I were in Orlando, uh, Florida. We were, it was spring break, and we were celebrating by spending a couple weeks in Orlando. And midway through our trip, so where we stayed, it was called the Berkeley, amazing pool, and midway through our trip, I'm putting on my bikini top, and I'm like, my, my hand brushed against the top of my left breast. And I was like, brushed across it, and I went, weird. I, there's like this hard lump. And it felt about the size of a walnut, and I have a history of breast cysts. So I was like, okay, well, it must be a breast cyst, but I told my husband, I'm like, Matt, come in, you've got to feel this. And he's like, oh, wow. And I said, it's probably a cyst. And just kind of in the back of my mind, I said, but if it's not a cyst, I think we're going to have a big problem. Got home, and, and it didn't go away. 
Um, so got home from the trip and I made an appointment with a nurse practitioner that I see and she felt it and she was like, it doesn't feel like a cyst. So she had some blood work pulled, pulled and by this time it was the beginning of April and I'm like, doesn't? She said, no. And I said, okay, well, but let's get it figured out because there's other things that it could be. Um, and of course, the biggest uh, fear you would have or the biggest concern I should say would be that it is cancer. Because it's not just a little pea size, like I would imagine, uh, when you first feel a cancer and kind of what you hear. Um, again, it was it was good. It was like the size of a walnut. So she sketched. She said, "I want you to have a diagnostic mammogram." So I I could not get in for six weeks with COVID, and I should also tell you too, I had not had a mammogram. So I'd had them faithfully from the time I was 35, started having mammograms. And I had missed, so 2020, I had my last one in 2019. 2020, with all that had gone on with COVID and just life had been really difficult, I just, I didn't do it. And 2021 came around, I still didn't do it. So I had not had a mammogram now for over two years. So she said, I'm going to schedule you for a, a, a um, diagnostic mammogram. You'll get your mammogram, and you will go right into another room, and you will have an ultrasound. Um, this will just be really definitive. Let's figure out what's going on here. So um, it was Friday, May 13th, um, and I headed over to Ashland Hospital, and my, my history is I do not like going to the doctor. I do it. It's not my thing. I get a lot of anxiety, and even more than I don't like doing that, I don't like taking any sort of like anything that I have to swallow, any kind of medication, any kind of ibuprofen. I have a history of migraines. I've had them my entire adult life, and I will take when it gets really, really bad. It's all I can do to take one ibuprofen, and then just because I just don't like it. So I had told my husband, I said, "Hun, would you please come with me to this? Like, it's probably no big deal, but, you know, with my history of, like, feeling anxious at doctors, please come with me. So he came with me, and um, I had the mammogram, and instead of just having one picture, for those of you that have had mammograms, they usually like do one or two pictures, and then off you go. The tech did a few pictures, went out of the room and consulted with the radiologist, and then came back into the room and said, we need more. And this happened, I would say, probably three to four times. So then after that, she said, okay, you can head over to see the ultrasound tech, and we're going to do an ultrasound. So I had the ultrasound, and the ultrasound tech said, I'm going to have you sit right here, put back on your, your shirt, I'm going to have you sit right here, and I'm going to get the radiologist, he wants to talk to you. And I was like, oh, okay. And he came in and he said, I think you have breast cancer. And I was, I, I mean, at that point, you're like, I think shock starts taking over, which praise the Lord for that, because it, you know, now looking back to take in um, just high trauma, your body starts starts compensating and you start having some just compensation and so I started crying and I was like what and I said it feels huge and he said I think that it is breast cancer but we will not know for sure until you go for your for a biopsy so I could get in for a biopsy the following Tuesday um and by the next day so by Wednesday the report came in from the biopsy that I had invasive ductal carcinoma, and it was progesterone, so it was hormone-driven, progesterone and estrogen-driven, and they grade your breast cancer right out of the gate, so you don't get staged, but you get graded, and it's either grade one, which is not super fast-growing, um, grade two, which is, you know, it, it's, it's growing, it's, it's more than one, and so it's like growing medium. And then you have grade three, which is a, a fast-growing breast cancer. And my pathology showed that I was grade three. It also showed from the imaging that, my, um, that the lump was the size of a walnut. And I had, in, from the imaging, it showed one, possibly two lymph nodes involved. So they knew for sure one. But the second lymph node was questionable. So, um, you know, from there... Which I need to get, I need to read my notes here. Um, so from there, um, I then came home and it was, it was well, I, I need to back up. So Friday night that I had the, um, the radiologist come in and tell me that he thought I had breast cancer, I go home that night and I could not sleep. So I'm sitting up all night long and what do we do? Well, me, 
I'm Googling. So I'm like, I'm Googling, what does this mean if I have breast cancer? I knew the sizes that they had, that they had found, like what does this mean? So I'm reading all these scholarly articles, because I'm trying to at this point stay away from the articles that are not scholarly. So I'm reading articles that have been written by doctors, and it is, it's probably two in the morning by this time, and I'm scrolling, and I click on a link that this doctor is talking about chemotherapy and how she believes that chemotherapy is an absolute, in certain cases, an absolute must, but you also need to tailor it to the person. So it's not just a one size fits all, it's more of a, a you tailor it to the person. And I'm like, I totally, I wanna, if I have breast cancer, I want to go meet this doctor and I want this doctor to treat me. So I'm scrolling to the bottom to see who the doctor is and where they, where they practice at, and I was shocked. It was to see my cousin Erin's face. Well, my second cousin's um, daughter, her name is Erin Chamberlain, and it was her face. And I'm like, Erin, I knew she had become a doctor, but I didn't know that she had become an oncologist at UCLA in San Luis Obispo. So at this point, I'm like, okay, that is God. I do not believe in chance. I do not believe in luck. I do not believe in, I believe in God. I believe that God has, just like what we read in Psalm 139, every day ordained for us. He has every moment ordained with purpose. So at that point, I'm like, uh, I if my biopsy comes back positive for breast cancer, so I'm going to tell Matt first, and I'm going to call Aaron second. And so, um, again, it did come back positive. Um, and I, so right from there, um, it, once it came back positive, I then was, um, and Erin got involved, and she picked my oncologist here, and I was scheduled to go see a surgeon to get the mass removed, and then also to see an oncologist. So we, um, three weeks go by, this all happens, I get genetic tested, there's lots of stuff that goes into it, and um, the day of my lumpectomy, so the surgeon said, you know what, you're a good candidate for a lumpectomy from the imaging we're seeing, we can do a lumpectomy and we can take out two lymph nodes, spare you from lymphedema and just do bare minimum while still getting all the cancer. So um, the, I had my lumpectomy and I had two lymph nodes removed and this was the beginning of June. And the week after my pathology came back and the, sur the surgeon that did it had taken five centimeters of breast tissue, so that's about like this, so we're talking like this, and um, he had taken two lymph nodes. And the five centimeters of breast tissue, and again, my I was supposed to be like a little over two centimeters, came back that the margins were not clear. So, you know, now we're talking, I automatically got upgraded to stage three cancer, and the two lymph nodes that they had taken were both cancerous. And not just a little bit of cancer, but um, so there's micro and then macromets, and there was, there was a decent amount of cancer in both lymph nodes. After that, um, I, I was then scheduled from there to have, um, to have surgery, a complete uh, mastectomy, and all of my lymph nodes taken out a month later. Hebrews 6.19 from the NIV says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. So a couple of years prior to this, so in 2020, um, some of my extended family um, went through a very, very traumatic time. And it was a time that was, um, there's a lot of things that will make themselves right here on earth. And then there are the things that, we have to really put our hope in heaven because it's not going to be made right here on earth. And this was one of those times. And so as I made my way to the hospital the night of uh, this traumatic event, um, I, off of the emergency department, was in a little room. Um, there was several of us gathered. And um, as the news of the loss was shared, I felt so, as I'm sitting in this room, and I remember being on my knees, I felt so clearly Hebrews 6, 19 pressed on my heart. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Um, the, the traumatic loss was so earthly shattering that there was no way, like I said, to ever make it right here on earth, that the only hope we had was 
that heaven, when the time came that, that we would go to heaven, that is where the right would be made wrong. But we also, in that, so in our hope of heaven, we also know that we're not there yet. And so our hope here on earth is that, like Romans 8.28 says, that we know that all things, that all things um, work together for the good of those who love Christ, who have been called according to his purpose. And so in that verse that I have this hope as an anchor for my soul, I felt again the Lord pressing strongly on my heart. Choose your hope wisely, Steph. Choose your hope wisely. If I hope in my body, if I hope in my results, if I hope in um, just kind of that the health and, and, and wealth prosperity gospel that's going around, just believe it and you're going to be healed, or just have hope and you're going to be healed, that's garbage. It, and I don't say that lightly. I don't. I, what our hope needs to be in is not in our own physical body or our circumstances. Our hope has to firmly be in Christ. That is the only place that's not going to be shaken. Um, I also, um, as I was preparing for my second surgery, um, I, I started journaling. And I, I started journaling kind of at the beginning of this. And I had written down Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid or terrified because of them. And I had put in there because of cancer. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I wrote in my journal um, on, uh, so this was before my mastectomy. I wrote, there is so much shock. I have to put on my glasses. There is so much shock, grief, and sense of overwhelmment with this type of diagnosis. From what I've seen and watched other women's breast cancer journey, this journey is not cut and dried. It changes and can be dramatic. Has the cancer spread? Is cancer treatment working? I have a new ache and pain. Is the cancer waiting, or is it cancer? Waiting for test results and then getting them and they are worse or better than what you had expected. I had intense lows, or I have had intense lows feelings of overwhelming and debilitating anxiety, the overarching feeling every minute of every day, how out of control of my life I feel. The list could go on. Then the Lord gently scoops me into his arms and whispers his comforting words, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Have hope, daughter. I have overcome anything Satan or this broken world does to you because I redeemed it all when I died on the cross, conquered death, and rose again. Amen, and I love you, dear Lord Jesus. You are my heart, my anchor, my redeemer, my God. I submit to you and trust you. So in between while I was waiting for my mastectomy, um, there was a lot of time to fear. There was a lot of time in my own thoughts. I had a month, and during that month, the Lord was teaching me how to turn to him even more, like I, I had had a history of anxiety, but I had, through his strength, I had not battled anxiety for over, a, well, since I was 30, but those old feelings of anxiety were trying to not only take root, but to have a heyday in my mind. And so on July 4th, um, I wrote, and this again was um, in between surgeries, I said, I have been spiraling in fear. Lord Jesus, please give me the courage to face my fear with my armor on and have courage to stand against the attack Satan is waging against my mind. I had an MRI on Friday and it went well. I was allowed to keep my head propped up during it so I could see out the entire time instead of your head is when you have a breast MRI and some of you I'm sure have had them, your head is down and, and you have this, you're right up against the top of the inside of the MRI machine. So it can be really claustrophobic if you battle claustrophobia. Um, and then they give you contrast. So I said I could taste a weird taste for just a bit, but felt nothing else. The results came back that there was no cancer in my right breast because they had deemed that I also had um, lobular tendencies to my breast cancer, which lobular breast cancer likes to show up in the other breast. In whatever breast does not have the cancer, lobular has a 30% chance of showing up in your other breast. So at this point, they were trying to see how far is this cancer. Um, and uh, let's see here. Oh, and my lymph nodes looked good. Um, this, so my lymph nodes looked good. Um, I, uh, they said from the MRI that they thought maybe I had inflammatory breast cancer, so just lots going on at this time. I had a lots of, I had a, 
a lot of opportunity to either fear or turn to the Lord with faith. Um, and I had chosen to fear at this point. I said I over-Googled uh, breast cancer and started down the trail of worry, anxiety, feeling sick and oppressed. Not because I have, or, and at that point they thought I had inflammatory breast cancer too. Um, so I had, I had started this worry, anxiety, Googling all the bad things that could happen. And I said I laid my armor down and I tried to face my breast cancer diagnosis on my own. Um, Satan has been firing terror arrows that have been hitting their target. I dropped my armor because I wanted to feel in control for just a bit. Because as you know, if you've gone through a really hard time and all of a sudden your life feels completely out of control, I think it's human nature and it's easy to do. We try and grapple for any sort of control. How can I feel any sort of control? And I was doing that. I was looking for any sort of control. Um, the submission it takes to walk every minute of my day in this season feels exhausting. I feel a constant tug of war in my mind between my flesh, the focus on the fact that I, at that point, had stage 3A breast cancer and what that means, and the fact that I will never, the fact that I will never have health security again, every ache and pain, test, all of that, and the fact that I don't even know where this cancer ends. My flesh is on sensory overload. It is screaming to panic, freak out, curl up in a ball on my bed, and don't get up. It just wanted to hide. And I prayed, Lord Jesus, please help me. Please, Jesus, my faith is so small. I am Gideon, a coward, and you are forever faithful. Forever loving, I am weak, and you are strong. I grapple for control from you when I have no business doing that. I feel like I get the control and then crumble under the weight. So, right, like we get our control that, we're, that we want so bad, whatever that looks like, and then it's exhausting and it's crumbling. And I said, I'm emotionally, physically, spiritually exhausted. Lord, I am wounded from dropping my armor. I need you desperately. Please surround me with your protection. I imagine crawling up into your arms and being held, cradled, comforted. Lord, please help me put back on my armor. I feel weak to be able to do it on my own. Ephesians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Stand firm, then, with your belt of truth buckled around your waist, with your breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, and sword of the Spirit, your shield of faith, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes of the, go comes of the gospel of peace. And I pray, please, let me extinguish all the flaming arrows of Satan. I love you, dear Lord Jesus. So, um, as I headed back for my next surgery, which was hopefully going to be my last surgery, um, again, we knew it was going to be a bilateral uh, mastectomy, so um, I was going to have both breasts removed, and I was going to have, um, I was going to have all, or as many as they could get, of the lymph nodes underneath my left armpit removed, and they were also going to place a port, um, for chemo. So they knew too, it was for sure I was going to need chemo. It was unsure what chemo load I was going to need, but that I would need chemo. So I went through the surgery and, um, and then you wait, you wait for your pathology and I'm healing fine. And it was a week later that the pathology came back from, from the lymph node dissection and the, the double mastectomy. And again, they were expecting from all the imaging, they're expecting to possibly three um, lymph nodes to be involved. And the surgeon had taken 25 lymph nodes and um, all 25 had cancer. And so at this point, um, that's a lot of cancer. And, and again, high grade, high stage. And the cancer was the size in my breast, it was about the size of a fist um, when all was said and done. And so, um, you know, by this time, you've got, you've got, you're trying to recover from surgery, and then you're trying to grapple with the fact, all these new terms, and then you're also trying to um, come to terms with just what are the next steps. And so during that time, um, I wrote in my journal, Luke 12:25. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And it was July 16th. 
Yesterday, my pathology report came back. They got clear margins in my mastectomy, but all 25 lymph nodes removed were cancerous. My flesh is so scared. Where does this cancer end, and has it metastasized to another organ? Please, Jesus, no, but if so, even then your strength will carry. I meet with my oncologist on Monday, and I'm sure he will order a PET scan to determine if the cancer has traveled. Luke 12, 7, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. John 9, 3, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. John 14, 27, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Um, so as this, as the news was coming in, like I said, I have a 12-year-old daughter who, I mean, she's at home. It, oh. And I've got, you know, my daughter-in-law was pregnant at this time with our second grandchild. Um, you know, we had a year-old grandchild. I'm looking at my kids. I'm looking at my husband. I'm looking at my family. And I'm going, Lord, what? Uh, no, as moms, we want to... We want to stay the stay the course, right? Like we're not. It's not innate in our nature to want to to want to go home to heaven while we still. I mean, I'm sure maybe some of you are more righteous than me. I did not. I'm like, Lord, I know heaven. I'm sure it's. I know it's going to be amazing, but please, not yet. Please, Jesus, no. Like my family needs me. My my kids need me, and my Ellie, and our precious Ellie. She's. She joined our family at birth by way of adoption and has gone through a lot in life already. And so at this point, I'm like, Lord, trying to submit, trying to submit. Like, there's a lot of things I feel like um, we can lay down. Like, oh, okay, our finances are not where they should be. It's hard to lay that. Or like, Lord, please help us to get back on track. Or, um, you know, we go through these bumps that are that we need to submit to the Lord. And, and what I will tell you, ladies, is wherever your season is right now, whatever opportunity you have to submit to the Lord, especially do it. Whether if it's small, submit it to the Lord. Just, Lord, I give whatever it is, no matter how small, no matter how large, start the foundation of submitting your life to the Lord. And just in your daily life, I appreciate, I appreciate what Megan was saying of, I mean, that's part of submitting to the Lord, too, is that you do um, your countenance, how you act, how you respond, um, practice, because that self-discipline, we don't know what God's going to call us to. Like I said, literally, it's in, it's in one brush of my left breast that forever altered, uh, set us on a path of, you know, of, of cancer. Um, so really, really choose, choose now to get the foundation of submitting to the Lord. So as all these thoughts are going through my mind, I, I just kept praying, Lord, please help me. Help me not only please let me live, but if not, I'm going to have to just trust that my kids, my family, that he will see them through. And if I am going to live, Lord, please let me honor you because I am so freaked out by this point. I still, to this day, it's hard not to be freaked out, but I'm like freaked out. And so they, um, they told me from what they saw in the pathology that because of the aggressiveness of my breast cancer and because of how far it had spread, I would need all the scans. So you go for PET scan and um, a, a, a MRI, a, another CT, or a CT, um, a bone scan, and they're looking for cancer anywhere else in my body. And they said, okay, if it has not spread beyond these 25 lymph nodes, which we don't see that very often with aggressive breast cancer, that it hasn't spread with that many lymph nodes. But if it has not spread, in the, in the chance it hasn't, I was actually, I think, more prepared for that it has and what stage four breast cancer means and, and just how to start walking that road. But they said, if by chance it has not, we are going to hit you with everything we've got. And this is a week after my mastectomy. And so I, I actually, a week and a half, I went for all the scans, and it had not spread. And so they said, you're headed right into chemo, and we're going to, instead of every three weeks, we're number one going to give you, it's called adriomycin. And adriomycin is, it's also, it's dubbed, um, its slang word is the red devil. So it is a, it's, it's a red chemotherapy that they give you, and 
it's the harshest uh, it's the harshest chemo you can have and they don't like to give it unless it's absolutely necessary just because of the side effects while you're getting it and then the side effects after it's it's a lifetime um, of possible side effects and so they said you will be getting adriomycin and cytoxin we're going to do dose dense instead of every three weeks we're going to give it to you every two weeks because with fast growing aggressive cancer it either responds amazing to chemotherapy or not so great and so we're going we're gonna to try and head this off. And so um, I, I started chemotherapy. And the prayers, so many prayers are going up, I mean, our way at this time. And it was like you could feel um, the prayers. I could feel, I know my husband could too, you could feel people's prayers. And it was like things that, that you should not be calm in. The Lord is giving a supernatural calm, but then also you can feel people's prayers. And so um, in one month's time, so meaning from my mastectomy, uh, July 8th or 9th, um, and then to August 8th or 9th, um, right around there, I had my double mastectomy, had my lymph nodes removed, got a port for chemo, started chemotherapy. Um, at my first chemotherapy, I had an allergic reaction. So the anaphylactic reaction, the reason why I don't like taking medication is because I'm freaked out of an anaphylactic reaction where your throat shuts off. And I had one. It was like the first medication they gave me, the pre-med. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I just sat in that chair and prayed. When they got it all under control, I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, please be with me. And I just kept playing over and over in my mind my reasons. So I, my kids, my husband my grandbabies, my family, and, and it's amazing, guys, as mamas, what we will endure for our babies. And it was like everything in me wanted to get up and run, and I, it was like, stay, sit, and I'm shaking, and, I'm, and they're giving me more chemotherapy. And so in that time, though, so I had an allergic reaction. Um, I was put into instant menopause. So... I was 46 years old, not going through menopause. I was put into instant menopause, a chemical menopause with an injection, and I lost all of my hair. And so um, I, uh, and I did not even, as I was preparing for this talk, it is the first time that I actually went back over and looked over everything. And I was like, you guys, God is so great and so big, but trauma in life and hard times in life are so real. <laughs> like it, It's when people are like, oh, God is good. You'll feel better. You'll be fine. It's God is good. God is amazing, but we're still called to live here on earth through hard, hard times, but he gives us our strength. Um, so um, my, my staging was upgraded to uh, stage three, uh, stage 3C, so that's just before you get to 4, and um, I, uh, I completed um, five or six months of chemotherapy, and then I went on to, um, to complete, at the beginning of this year, 30 radiation treatments. Um, the life, or the normal life that I knew was over, like over, but not without hope. Um, the trauma and grief have been profound. And if I don't keep a constant surrender in my mind to the Lord, the reality of my diagnosis, because even with all the medication, even with all the chemo, even with the surgery, I take two after medications uh, that I'll be on one for the rest of my life as long as the cancer does not mutate, and I will be on the other one, which is basically like an oral chemo for three years. And you feel pretty junky when you're on the, the targeted therapy, which acts like an oral chemo. Um, even with all of that, um, well, and with all of that, I still have a one in four chance that the cancer will return and will metastasize somewhere in my body. Um, so it's not like it knocked it out completely. Um, had I not, had I not done, uh, what I did, there would have been close to a 90% chance. And so, you know, each treatment you do knocks down the percentage even more, but I will never be able to... Um, get below that like 25% chance that it will be back. And my husband always reminds me, well, it's 75% chance that it won't. And I'm like, that's awesome, but it's 25% chance that it will. And so it's a constant daily surrender for me 
of the what ifs. The, the, is it the medication causing all of this pain or is it, what, what is it? And then to surrender to the Lord. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 11 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, as I was thinking over my journey and praying about it, I thought, what kind of um, life applications? Again, Megan, I appreciate that you did this in your devotion. But I thought, what kind of life applications would I want to encourage you ladies with um, from the story, from my story? And I, I have a few. Um, so my first one is, we will experience trouble in life. We just will. But take heart. John 16.33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Whatever it is that we are going to experience, my breast cancer or whatever, you fill in the blank. Whatever you are going through or will go through, it did not take the Lord by surprise. It didn't, it, it, nothing was ever out of control and it won't ever be before the Lord. He has it under control. And he also, if I surrender, because I can choose, um, like you were saying, Megan, again, how we can act in our homes um, to our husbands, kind or unkind, I have a choice every minute of every day what I do with this. I can choose to either surrender and say, okay, Lord, I don't want to be on this journey. I don't. I, I would rather have my old life back, but that's not possible. So what I can do is forget what was behind, grieve it, but forget what is behind, and choose to say, Lord, I am yours. I am, I am yours. I feel physically, I don't think I'm going to be a candidate for reconstruction. I, I had a lot of radiation. There's a lot that went on. But you, Lord, but you can still, as, as you know, body image is big in our world. And, and body image, you know, it, it looks different for me. But you, Lord, you have a purpose even in that. Or how I feel every day, Lord, I just surrender it to you. And the representation that, that we portray for Christ and our own thoughts, what we tell ourselves, whether we allow God's truth to come into our minds when we're having doubts, fears, anger, um, overwhelmed, whatever it is, or whether, so whether our own truth takes root or whether God's truth takes root. Uh, Romans 5, 3 through 5, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So you guys, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the hope of heaven. We're equipped. We're equipped to be able to withstand hard, hard, tragic stuff. We are, through Christ, we're equipped. We might not want to, we might not want to um, endure, and we at times may feel like we can't, but we can. Not in a, like when people say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yes, we absolutely can do all that God has called us to in his strength. Um, Romans eight twenty eight again, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So whatever you are going through today, um, or whatever you will go through, we know, and even in my journey, that even when it looks so dark and so tragic and so awful, God is still working, and he, still work it, he will still work it out for his glory and our good. Even if it's, we don't feel it, the side of heaven, we can walk by faith and trust that he will. Um, we know that we, so like I said, we know that we will experience hard times, um, our, our hard times will never be wasted. They will be used for our sanctification and for Christ's glorification. Others will take notice. And when they take notice, we want them to see Christ in us. I mean, who doesn't look for, who doesn't, like if you guys know somebody's going through a really hard time or, or something, it's almost like you, you stop and you take notice and you're like, wait, what? Or, and you pay attention and Others are paying attention at all times. 
and I'll get to our kids paying attention, but our, others are paying attention, and we have a unique and a, an amazing opportunity to show Christ, especially in our hard times. Um, my second is the Lord always gives us what we need. Choose to believe this and have faith. So it didn't always feel like the Lord was giving me what I needed. I felt like I needed deliverance from my breast cancer. I needed it to only be in two lymph nodes at the most and for it to be a nice, tidy package of what 85% of women will experience, which is, you know, they catch it early and voila, you get to, I mean, it's still a hard journey, but it's usually not a lifetime of medication. It's, it's treatable and... Um, but the Lord always gives us what we need. So may, while I may have wanted that, that is not what the Lord saw that I needed. Um, we don't, so the Lord always gives us what we need. Probably one of the biggest things on my journey, and I totally do this too, is people will say to me, I do not know what I would do if that happened to me, right? Like we think I'll hear of something awful that happens to somebody and I'm like, I don't know what I would do. Oh my goodness. But you know what? We don't have to wonder. We can't, and then we imagine what we would do, and we're feeling all anxious and overwhelmed and, and terrible. And then, but what we're doing is we're imagining it without God's strength. So we're promised that whatever God calls us to go through, he will give us the strength right when he needs it, right when we need it. So he's not, if I would have known two years ago that, Stephanie, you are going to go through, you're going to be diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. You're going to have 25 lymph nodes affected. It's going to be the size of a fist in your breast. You're going to lose your breast. You're going to um, have an anaphylactic reaction while you're having the harshest chemo that is available. Uh, I, I, would have, I would have flipped out. Anxiety through the roof, and Stephanie would have been in bed, heveled down, completely freaked out, because I'd have been like, <gasps> because that was not the timing when I, if I would have known it two years ago, what was coming, that was not the timing that the Lord was going to have me go through it. So when he did have me step into, into my diagnosis, he has given me strength every single minute of every single day. And it's been a year and a half. And I can trust that he will continue every single minute, every second of every minute of every day. He will give me what I need. Maybe not what I want, but he will give me the strength to endure whatever comes my way. And he will, you too. He is a faithful God, and he will. Um, so, so don't, if you can really try and watch, what ifs? What if? What if? And personalizing. Because then too, it takes away from valuable time that you have as moms to focus on what is true and what is real. That, you know what, if you do go through it, God will give you the strength. He just will, if you choose to surrender to him. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the, of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, we read in Psalm 139 that every day was ordained for us before one of them came to be, and that there is nowhere we can go that Christ is not with us. Because of this and the Holy Spirit inside of us, we will never be without comfort and hope, no matter how scary the situation we are facing. So just as they were getting ready to take me back for my mastectomy, um, the, they offer you a nerve block because it's a big surgery that they're doing, and the nerve block helps with the pain after. And so the, the, the doctor um, said, do you want this? I said, yes. And so easily she gets the, it's like a long needle, she gets the needle put into my right breast, and she, it was quick. She goes to put it into my left breast, and I see her, um, and I'm, I'm fully awake. I'm just like waiting to go back to the OR, and I see her looking at the monitor, and she, she moves the needle more, and she moves it more, and she's looking at the monitor, and I'm looking at the monitor, and she goes, there is nowhere in your breast where I need to put this that I don't see cancer. And I was like, and I'm getting ready to go back into the OR, which is, I mean, that's nerve-wracking in itself. And I remember laying there, and just saying, Lord Jesus, right now, I cannot even, I cannot even intake all of this, but I know that you are in control, and I'm going to imagine myself crawling up into your arms and, and having him literally hold me like you would hold a baby. And I was like, Jesus, please just hold me. And they wheeled me back to the OR. And in those moments, well, in every moment, he does. It's like, no, he's not physically, you're not, you're not physically, you know, 
he's not physically holding you. It's something even better. It's your soul. It's he's holding your soul and he's comforting you, pouring so much love into us saying, I've got you, daughter. I've got you. Um, so no matter what it is, we can put our complete trust, not only in the Lord, but surrender to him. Um, my third is armor up and lay a foundation now, which I mentioned earlier, get tools. Um, I'm going to read one more time, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that when you take your stand against the devil's schemes, um, or oh, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. My struggle is not against, it's not against um, breast cancer. My struggle is against my own will and, and Satan's fiery darts that say, no, 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 I took good care of my body. I shouldn't have this. This does not make sense. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm not... You know, just the factors that would determine this kind of breast cancer. I don't. I nursed for three years. I all the things that you know. You go through the checklist. That's where my mind says, "I this isn't fair. I shouldn't have this." No, no, no. That's that's not truth. What the truth is is that that that's Satan telling me, "Not fair. Not fair." Like trying to put his little arrows, and that's not the truth. Um. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the arrows of the flaming, or all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. So again, choose to lay a foundation now before the trials come, or if you are in a trial, start today. If you have not already, start today. Um, Start implementing your armor. I literally get down on my knees at home, and I'm holding up my hands, and I'm praying. I have my Bible laid out in front of me, and I'm praying my armor. I'm like, please, Jesus, whatever it takes, ladies, because Satan, he's good. He's good at what he does, and he's done it for a long time. And it's sometimes we have to get pretty nitty-gritty, like I said, down on our knees, like hands up, please, Jesus. Um, and some ways to consider preparing are read your Bible regularly and obey God's word. So it's easy to read the Bible, right? Like we can all read it, but then to obey it. So um, read your Bible regularly and obey God's word. Speak it out. Have it plain in your house. There were nights during chemo, well, and I still to this day because I battle insomnia, um, where they give you the pre-med. So they give you high doses of steroids and then they deliver your chemo. So you've got your brain, for any of you who have taken steroids or your kids have had to, your brain is running a marathon. Like you're just, your brain's running a marathon and your body feels like crud. Your body feels like you actually got ran over by a truck. So it's hard to reconcile the two in your brain. So you stay up all night, you sit there, and you're like, oh, and but I feel so bad, but I could like get up and clean my house. If I could clean it with my eyes, I would clean it all night long. And I would have, I would have, um, Ephesians. I would have First Peter plain right by my head. I'd lay on the couch, and I would just have God's word plain because my heart was so. I was just very, very overwhelmed and over like sensory overload. Um, so listen, not only obey, but listen to God's word. Have it plain in your house, um, and then study God's word. Pursue deeper understanding, um, and diligently study God's word. Uh, take your thoughts captive by replacing them. So replacing the what-if thoughts or the fearful thoughts, replace them with Bible verses. Um, my biggest fear with my cancer is that it will metastasize. Um, and what I have to do, though, is it doesn't matter what science says. Cancer does not control my life. God does. So again, Psalm 139, all the days ordained for us were written in his book before one of them came to be. God has that control. He has it over our kids. It's not just us parents. He's got it over our kids. Every single human being that is living and breathing on earth, their life is already ordained by God. Every day ordained for them before one of them came to be. 
Uh, seek out mature Christians who can pray for you and hold you accountable. Have fellowship with other believers. Um, become Christ-centered and not self-centered. Evaluate your life through the lens of God's word. And, and then um, commit to praying for others. So I had, while I was going through my journey, this, this little journal right here, a dear friend gave me, it is filled with prayers that she prayed during my journey. And I, I have, I thought, this is the best gift we can give others. It's a way to get our minds off of ourselves, and it's a way to practice biblical praying for others. Um, and then my, well, and then use God's word against Satan. So I got this phrase from a dear friend too. If you don't know the Bible, you can't use it correctly. So again, know your Bible. Um, and then my last one, which is that we are always representing Christ. So for the young moms in here and who have young children at home, well, for the old moms too, I still have a child at home, um, every minute that our, children's, that our children are with us and they're watching and what we represent to them about Christ, that will go on for a life. I mean, they can make their own choices as they get older, but we have the choice, mamas, to pour into our kids through our good times and through our hard times, Jesus. And Jesus is truth. And he, your, your children are watching you. They're watching. And as we go through hard times, we can tell them, this is what I, I would tell my, which I would tell my daughter, uh, Ellie, often else as she, because she is the one of, she still lives at home, so she's the one who got to see me at my sickest, um, and spent a lot of days on the couch when an 11-year-old should be doing whatever they do in the summer. She spent it on the couch sitting by me, because she chose to. Um, she's more of an introvert, but um, got to see a lot of sickness, and it's like, it also gives us a chance to say, but God's got this. I don't know what it's going to look like. I had to be honest with her, and I still do. I don't know what it's going to look like, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. It might metastasize. It might not. None of us do. But what we do is, is we choose Jesus for our kids. We say, but you know what? God's got this under control. It might not look how we want it to, but he is faithful. He will see us through. And what an opportunity, ladies, when your children are still at home. It's different when they get older. You, just, you can still pour in Jesus, but it looks different. You have the opportunity to set a foundation for your kids of biblical truth that will make it so much easier for them as they get older and they have to face the world. And we also have the example we set for our husbands, for those watching. So we are always representing Christ. So that is all. <laughs> I Yeah, that is... God bless each one of you. Thank you for uh, just for listening. Like I said, I, this is my first time. I spent last week shaking and crying as I went back over my diagnosis. I actually, I called my sister-in-law and I was like, do you know that in a month's time, this is what I went through? And she was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't, even, I didn't even realize how much this is like, this is a lot, but God. And so, like I said, I would encourage you that whatever whatever is coming your way or is in your path right now, number one, prepare. And if you don't know Jesus, that is the number one way to prepare is that is, is accepting Christ into your heart. So I don't know if every one of you know Jesus, but if you don't, please feel free to seek out myself, my sister-in-law, Liz, my sister, Jody, Erica, Rebecca, one of us, and we will pray with you and go through the steps. But if you know Jesus, you're equipped and we can do this. It's hard, but we can do this. So God bless each one of you. And um, I'm going to go ahead and pray. And, and it's 1042. Should I pray and close right now, or should I say, ask questions? I'm going to pray, and then I'll see if anyone has any questions. If not, then you guys will visit. And I'm actually going to ask, when I pray, Rebecca, Erica, Jody, and Liz, will you guys come up here with me?
This is my cousin, Rebecca, and you guys met uh, my sister-in-law, Liz, my sister, Jody, and my sister-in-law, Erica, you guys know, but this is the gift of friendship and the gift of family, friendship, and just friends, that, friends and family that have surrounded uh, me with prayer, and I'm very thankful to you ladies, and yeah. So Heavenly Father, I just lift up this group of ladies here today, Lord. I lift up each one of their children. I lift up each one of their husbands. Lord, I lift up their future children's children. And Heavenly Father, I just I lift up the ladies also. I just ask that you anoint them, Lord, with the knowledge that they are making such a big difference. Lord, not only in this generation and their own kids, but in the generations to come, Lord, the foundation that they are laying in their homes with their husbands and with their children, it matters, Lord, not just today or tomorrow, but for generations to come. Thank you for entrusting us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for entrusting us with everything we need to walk in this life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, successfully through you, Lord. Lord, for any woman who is struggling today, in whatever it is, Lord, I just ask that you comfort her how you have comforted me, Lord, because that's what you offer, a love that supersedes anything we could ever imagine. So please comfort her, Lord. Give her wisdom to know what is the godly thing to do, Lord. Please bind any of her flesh responses that she may want to react in, Lord. Please let her walk biblically discerning, and Lord, please just guard and keep her. Lord, thank you so much for your presence. Lord, I say this not even wanting to say it, but Lord, my heart knows, thank you for my diagnosis, Lord, as hard as it has been, Lord, getting to know you uh, and feeling your presence even more has been worth its weight in gold. Heavenly Father, we walk forward from today uh, just thankful for you, Lord, and thank you, Lord. We love you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> and even you guys can ask personal questions, questions about mothering. I've been a mom for 27 years, like I said. Have not always done it successfully, but I'm, yeah. So when um, I was diagnosed, I have always been a big sugar eater, love sugar, and I, none of this, I'm not relating any of this to cancer, so did I get cancer because I eat sugar? No. Uh, there's other factors, and um, I'm sure, but so after I was diagnosed, I made a choice to go off of all like processed sugar, so I still have honey and um, fruit, but all processed sugar. I went off of gluten. Um, I went off, uh, I started juicing every day. So celery, lemon, my sister actually got me on juicing because chemo and the medication I'm on now is so harsh that, you know, just trying to like detox. Um, so I juice every morning and exercise and, um, have fared for the chemo load that I had. Um, I feel like it really helped. The nutrition really helped with, um, with just navigating the practicalness of chemotherapy and, and, and medications and surgeries and healing. So yes, I did make some significant lifestyle changes that I will continue on. This is not to put it on to anybody, um, but it is something that I personally felt like I needed to do just because I wanted to be, at, and I still want to be at my best um, versus... If I don't, because I have, so I had a, I had a radical hysterectomy in April and I cannot take any sort of medication, which I can't take any sort of bioidentical hormones. So when you don't have estrogen in your body, every bone in your body can really hurt. You just have other things. And so, um, and they want to give you medication, which is not bad. So if somebody is on medication because your bones are hurting from a lack of estrogen, it's okay. Good for you. That's, that's great. I, started swimming and exercising, which has really helped. Um, so really I made my lifestyle changes so I could feel my best 
for me um, as I walk this journey. I don't know. <laughs> that, yeah. Yes. I don't even have one. She asked, what question do I wish that somebody would ask me? I feel like I have just flooded you guys with <laughs> way more than what I, and actually I was going to come in here, I was going to have my neat, tidy 15 minutes, I know, really quick, I was going to teach you guys about breast exams, and like, make sure you do your self-checks, make sure if you feel a lump, go to your doctor, and when the time is appropriate, make sure and get your mammograms. Like I was going to keep it really cut and dried. And I kept feeling this like prompting, like get out your journal, go back over your story. And I was like, nah, but I, I'm like, I don't want to disobey you Lord, because like, I want to be obedient. And so I feel like I've already flooded you guys. So Jode. I just wanted you to speak it out. Um, when you and I were talking about if I were to find a lump, because obviously you and I are yeah. sisters, um, what what you would do differently after that came back that you had 25 lymph nodes? Remember when you said when to do, how, how you would do the mastectomy with the biopsy? Do you remember that conversation you had with me? Yeah, but that is so... For, for me, um, when I had my biopsy, I... Something shifted. I don't know scientifically what happened. May I something shifted, and it felt like my for me that my lump got excessively bigger. Did it? I don't know. But um, now, if I were to need another biopsy, I would also want to have surgery pretty much right away if it came back as cancer instead of waiting for. Um, by the time all the cancer was taken out, I think it was like six weeks. So. For me personally, I would choose to um, schedule those things uh, sooner if possible. It's not always possible, but for me, that's what I would choose to do. And what is your name? Anessa. Hi, Anessa. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for your story. Thank you. Is there any other questions? A big one was, well, and it's interesting even reading back through what, well, it was Rebecca. I'm just going to say your name. Rebecca, this is filled with prayers from Rebecca. Um, praying for me was huge. Um, being a listening ear was huge. I think a lot of times people want to fix, so it was like um, they would try and, like, tell me how to, what treatment to get or, and all good intentions, but it's like they didn't, they're not the ones who sat in that oncology office and, you know, they gave you the statistics if you didn't do what you were doing or whatever, but probably first and foremost prayer and then um, cards were huge. I still have every card that people sent me. Cards of encouragement were huge because I could read them in my own time, in my own way. I had people deliver meals, which was huge. Um, yeah, and just somebody who listened, or even who could, I've learned a lot. I used to be the wanting to fix people. Uh, I've had the anguish, but also the privilege of walking with my sister-in-law, Liz, through um, just trauma. Um, and before my breast cancer diagnosis, I would sit with her and like, want to fix it, want to fix, 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 talk, talk, I'm sorry, talk, 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 or whatever. And that does no good. At least, like, what I've realized is, sitting, like going, sitting by her, not even needing to say a word and just putting my hand right on her, right on her leg or whatever, whatever's appropriate, goes so far. So, um, but not trying to fix. Yeah. 
that's a thank you for yeah that's a good all of these are good questions but any last questions yeah olga and hi olga So she asked if it strengthened my marriage or if it was tough. And so um, prior to my diagnosis, my husband and I are both very strong-willed. And if you know us, and it's not a secret, we got, well, because we got married so young, we developed such immature habits. And we had continued in those immature habits. And we were just in a season of um, immature habits. So nothing, uh, just immature, like... Not bitey. I would be like, you're so annoying. And he'd be like, so are you, or whatever. Like, just not, uh, not kind to each other. Um, and so we were really working on it uh, for about a year prior to my diagnosis. Um, and then when my diagnosis came, I, the Lord has given Matt, so it has strengthened my marriage. It has been hard because, as you can imagine, a normal, we've had a normal marriage. And overnight, it completely changes, not only physically, um, but you, when you don't have hormones, when you're going through chemotherapy, you, there's a lot of stuff that married couples do that you cannot do, it's, or they really advise you not to. And um, So for us, um, my oncologist just told Matt uh, at my last appointment last week, he said, you are one of the few that have stuck around. And so he said that he sees so often that men um, when this happens, they can't, it's, they, they just decide that it's not, it's too much. Their woman's, their woman's too emotional, whatever it is. And so to date for Matt and I, um, that is the, we really have pressed into each other and literally have held on for dear life, um, for us. Yeah. To date. Praise the Lord. Pra yes. Uh, praise the Lord. I totally agree. But you know, we're human and marriage, it, yeah, and so um, had this. I feel like it has strengthened us. Yes, I feel like um, I feel like it has strengthened us. Yes. Yeah. Jen. I started having mammograms at 35 because our grandma was diagnosed uh, just a little bit older than me with the same breast cancer. So I have all, I, for pretty much my entire adult life, I have been worried that I would get breast cancer, which is funny because I didn't. Uh, so um, I am glad I started at 35 having my baseline. Um, I'm thankful that I did that, and it was okayed by insurance because my grandma had had cancer. Um, so, and I think self-check, so for you ladies, most of you in here are too young for like, to go get mammograms. There's, you know, most of you probably have not had a mammogram. Um, but with that said, I would say if there's a history in your family of breast cancer, Go to your doctor and talk about getting at least a baseline mammogram and do your self-checks. I do your self-checks, and if you do not know how to do self-checks, find me, or Rebecca's a nurse, Liz is a nurse, I am a practical nurse, uh, find us and we will, you know, we'll, we'll explain how to do it or go to your doctor, but do your self-checks, even if you're 23 years old or 25, because you know, if you feel any kind of abnormality, don't wait, go right in. So yeah, I mean, yes. To thermal, and I have not. So if you guys are interested in that, talk to Jen. My journey has been really mainstream, as you know. So, you know, I did not, while I'm eating healthy, um, I did not, I have not gone the, you know, natural chemo. Like, I've just, mine has been fast, furious, and, you know, normal mammograms. And so if you are interested in that, Jen, are you comfortable with people seeking you out after? Okay. So seek out Jen after if you are interested in thermo, thermal energy, or energy. Thermal, imaging. thermal inner imaging. I cannot, <laughs> thermal imaging.
Correct. So what do you have in place um, that is yeah, indicators like for signs of like healing? So my doctor had taken um, some blood work and when I saw the blood work come in, um, I noticed that there were a few things off. And so, you know, I would say if you are, if you feel a lump, go to your doctor right away. They will, they'll pull some blood work. Um, because yeah, cancer, that was, I didn't feel sick. Like I had been a little bit extra tired, but I had also become a grandma and life was full throttle. So I didn't, you know, I didn't think much about it, but the lump never did hurt. Yeah. Cancer does not hurt. It's not like my cyst would hurt and cancer did not hurt. So like I said, any, even if it's a peewee amount of like you feel something hard, really get it checked out because better, you know, better to know what it is than to not. So are we, one last. Um, so I had cancer five years ago. I had a mastectomy as well. Um, but there was no, there was no lump. It was just some discharge that I had concerns about. And I asked my doctor and we went through all the steps. So that's something to think about as well. Thank you. So really any kind of, any kind of abnormality that you feel yours was discharge, um, a lump, any sort of abnormality, just get checked out. It's, yeah. Thank you for sharing. How are you doing today? Yeah. And that is on the breast, I am on several breast cancer pages and, you know, it used to be, you start mammograms at 40 because, you know, that is when they would see a higher rise, like the fifties would, and when you're in your fifties, they would see a higher rise in breast cancer. And now, you know, it, yeah, you, I mean, on this page, it, there's twenties, thirties, forties, unfortunately, but wow. So yeah. Okay. We are done. Thank you. You guys join me in thanking Stephanie. Thank you for listening.